So our next speaker is Shamit Kachru from Stanford, and he's going to talk to us about new phenomena in compactifications with flux. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm talking about work done with several collaborators, Sandeep Trivedi of TIFR and three students at Stanford, Mike Schultz, Zhao Lu, and William McAllister. So I think it's fair to say that the usual starting point for any kind of string model building of physics in four dimensions uh, involves a choice of some Calabi Yau manifold, M. Um, maybe in type two theories, one should really consider an orientifold of M if one's interested in minimal four-dimensional supersymmetry, but that's somehow a generic starting point. Now, a simple problem with this picture, as we've heard from several other speakers, is that most such choices of M come with moduli, many more moduli than we'd like. There are Kähler moduli, which describe uh, ways to change the sizes of various even-dimensional cycles in the calabi -Yau. And there are complex structure moduli that basically describe how the three cycles in the calabi -Yau deform around as you change them. Now, while these moduli spaces have beautiful and intricate structure that's been explored in mirror symmetry, for instance, uh, physically, it's a serious problem for obvious reasons. First of all, the four-dimensional low-energy effective Lagrangian that one describes physics with depends on the expectation values of the moduli. And so you have a loss of predictivity in any attempts to make uh, models out of string theory. And the second, um, also, I think, well-known problem is that in most scenarios for eventual supersymmetry breaking in string theory, um, many of the old scenarios, at least, led to TeV masses for the moduli. And it's a result that I learned from this paper, maybe it goes further back, that gravitationally coupled TeV mass particles that, that uh, don't couple to any gauge interactions um, can cause all kinds of cosmological problems. So they're basically ruled out. So what I want to talk about here, and again, other speakers have touched on this already, at least for part of my talk, is that there's a generic and calculable effect in string theory that helps to improve this situation, though it doesn't really fix it completely. And for concreteness, I'm going to discuss this calculable effect in the type 2b string theory, but there would be very good analogs of what I'm saying in the M theory framework or type 2a or heterotic, uh, as you choose. So in the type 2b framework, we know that there are various Ramon, Ramon, and Nevo Schwartz uh, higher form gauge fields. And in particular, there's, there are two different three form field strengths, H3 from the NS sector and F3 from the Ramon, Ramon sector. And we can combine these if we want for convenience later into a complex three form. Uh, where we stick a factor of the axio dilaton field in front of H. So given that this calabi -Yau has non-trivial three cycles, and given that we have three-form field strengths, one should in some sense generically consider the possibility of turning on fluxes of these three forms through the various three cycles in the geometry. So here's sigma i is just running over some set of three cycles. So in that context, we get a picture that looks a little bit complicated. We don't just have the calabi -Yau M or its orientifold M tilde. But while well, the orientifold action has introduced some uh, orientifold fixed points, which have orientifold three planes associated with them. And then for tadpole cancellation, we need some D3 brains. And we have some cycles in the calabi -Yau, and they're threaded with these fluxes. Okay, so again, M tilde is M mod sigma composed with omega. Sigma is some appropriate Z2 symmetry. I'll talk about a very simple example momentarily. And omega is the world sheet parity transformation. And there's an alternative, uh, and in some sense, more general language of F theory on fourfolds that could describe the same set of constructions, uh, but I'll stick to the, the simple 2B language. And today, what I'd like to do is briefly discuss three different aspects of such models. So the first one I've already alluded to in my introduction, the fluxes yield a calculable potential, which fixes many of the moduli in some cases. And it can do so at a quite high scale well above in, in models one would be interested in making, well above the TeV scale, without completely breaking supersymmetry. <laughs> so I'll discuss this in the simplest case of M equals T6, but it'll be clear how to generalize. The second point I'd like to discuss is that in this context, one can find cases where models with different amounts of unbroken Minkowski space supersymmetry appear as part of a larger configuration space, and they're connected uh, by, or rather separated by potential barriers, which are in some sense calculable, I'll explain the sense, and, and which are very low compared to the string or Planck scale. So you can really see a configuration space where vacuo with these different amounts of supersymmetry all sit as different islands. 
And then the third point I'll discuss if I have time is that, as I mentioned, a lot of these models require D3 brains for tadpole cancellation. And the dynamics on such brains then as you kick them around, as they roll around on the manifold, gives by definition rise to a cosmology of sorts. And in some cases, uh, these cosmologies are actually kind of cute. One of them, for instance, that I'd like to talk about uh, naturally presents one with something that to certain observers appears to be a bouncing k equals zero Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric. So let me start with my, my first subject out of fixing moduli. So I mentioned we can turn on these three-form fluxes in the geometry, but there are various constraints we have to satisfy when doing so. The two most obvious are, well, in string theory, unlike supergravity, these fluxes are quantized. So we have to turn on integral fluxes through the various three cycles. Or we should choose f and h to be some integral three forms. And the other is the tadpole cancellation condition, which in some orientifold model tells you that, well, you get negative d3 brain charge from orientifold fixed points like that. And so that must be canceled by some number of d3 brains. And then it turns out there's also an anomalous contribution to d3 charge from these fluxes. So depending on how many fluxes or how much flux you turn on, you have to alter the number of D3 brains. In some cases, there are models with no D3 brains at all. So let's go through this in the simplest possible case where M is just T6 mod Z2. And already there, there will be some interesting phenomena. So the involution acts by you taking the six T6 coordinates, Xi and Yi, and inverting all six of them. And you can convince yourself quickly that uh, since X and Y have period one, this symmetry has 64 fixed points because either any of the x's and y's can be 0 or a half. So you get 2 to the 6th. So this tadpole cancellation condition, up to constants I'm not worrying about, uh, tells you that you have 16 units of d3 brain charge that you have to somehow cancel. You could add 16 d3 brains, or you could turn on some flux and add a different number of d3 brains. Okay. And in particular, if there's no flux at all, this is a model that any of you who, who are very familiar with string theory know well, if you take the type 1 theory, in 10 dimensions, it already has 16 D9 brains. And if you T-dualize it on a 6 torus, you get exactly this model. You'd get T6 mod Z2 with 16 D3 brains and no flux. And that model, in addition to the D brain moduli, comes with 38 closed string moduli. So it'll be the fate of those 38 closed string moduli as we turn on the fluxes that I discussed in this first part of the talk. So, well, what happens when you turn on the fluxes to these moduli and to the, the n equals 4 supersymmetry that the, the type 1 string enjoyed on a torus? So here's g again. And the reason we define g is that if you reduce the flux kinetic terms in 10 dimensions, once you've given the, these fluxes expectation values on the manifold, they give rise in four dimensions to what looks like a potential that's easily stated in terms of g. It looks like the norm squared of the imaginary anti-self-dual part of g. So since G is a three-form on a six-dimensional manifold, we can naturally decompose, its, um, decompose it into imaginary self-dual and anti-self-dual anti, and anti -self parts, where they're defined by what happens to them under the, the star operator. That's analogous to taking a two-form in four dimensions and writing it as self-dual plus anti-self-dual. So anyway, the result for the potential is the norm squared of the imaginary anti-self-dual part. And what that means is, first of all, the potential is positive semi-definite. So if we find vacua, they'll probably have a zero cosmological constant. And of course, you get vacua precisely, at least some of them, when it vanishes, which means that G should be purely imaginary self-dual so that this norm squared can vanish. It has no IASD piece. Now, that's interesting if you want to find solutions in general, but many of those solutions will be non-supersymmetric. And then higher orders in perturbation theory will cause problems with our analysis. So, we might want to impose supersymmetry instead, and that leads to slightly stronger conditions. One finds instead of just being purely ISD, the G should also be of type 2-1 in the complex structure on your Calabi L. And it should be uh, what's called primitive, so if J is the Kähler form of the Calabi L, J wedge G should vanish. And one can derive these conditions from a standard four-dimensional field theory, four-dimensional effective field theory of the string compactification, where there's this uh, gukov waffle witten superpotential, also described by previous speakers. And uh, there's a KOR potential, which governs the normal metrics on the uh, KOR and complex structure moduli space of the Calabi L. And there are also uh, some D auxiliary fields and D terms, uh, which impose the primitivity constraint. 
the structure of these uh, sort of spontaneously broken supergravities has been worked out in a nice series of papers, uh, some of which appear there. So anyway, if we then fix some choices of these integral three forms, okay, we then get some equations that should govern what the module I want to do. And in particular, since G is defined in terms of H and F in the dilaton, uh, these equations sh should arrange the moduli so that G becomes purely imaginary self-dual or satisfies the constraints for supersymmetry. And that will turn out to fix many, though not all, of the moduli. Okay, so one can do generic countings, but uh, an example is often worth many words. So here's the example, the simplest possible set of examples I know, where you just take m to be t6, and I'll look at a particular simple choice of the fluxes. So here's some, a few integral three forms. You take f to be dx1, dx2, dx3 with some integer coefficient a0 and then A multiplying a series of three other terms, B a series of three other terms, and B naught. And for H3, you do the same, so you get four more integers, C naught, C, D, and D naught. So the details of this subclass of examples don't matter so much, it's more the flavor. Now the complex structure of this torus, we had real coordinates X and Y. So to get a complex structure, we have to introduce a period matrix tau, and then the DZs are defined this way in terms of the real coordinates X and Y. And that superpotential, which looked like G wedge omega, will then, of course, give you equations that constrain the choice of tau. Because omega, dz1, dz2, dz3, uh, is some complicated function of tau. And with the special choice of fluxes I just made, okay, uh, one can go through these equations in great detail, which I won't do here because I have time constraints. And you can quickly convince yourself that supersymmetry requires that the six torus have a particularly simple period matrix. In fact, it looks like roughly a product of three T2s, all with the same tau. Okay. So T2, of course, is just characterized by one complex number tau. And then the remaining equations that you have to satisfy after you've made that onsatz um, are that W itself should vanish for supersymmetry, and uh, D5 of W should vanish for phi is the delton, and then D tau of W should vanish. Okay. So those are the normal equations you'd expect for a supersymmetric vacuum in no-scale supergravity. You can look quickly and convince yourself that these first two equations uh, just yield cubic polynomials in tau. So setting them to zero says that you must solve these two cubic equations with integer coefficients. And then we can always solve the third equation for the second field, phi, so we ignore this third equation. So for this particular subclass of fluxes, we reduce the problem of finding supersymmetric vacua to the problem of finding choices of flux, choices of these integers, such that these two cubics have a simultaneous solution with non-zero imaginary part for tau, because if tau is purely real, you get a singular geometry. Now, for P1 and P2 to share a common root with imaginary part of tau non-zero, well then, by general facts, they'll also share the complex conjugate root, which means that they'll share a common quadratic factor. And you can convince yourself by elementary arguments that that common quadratic factor must, in fact, be proportional to this thing. Okay. But this thing is also now, it's a quadratic, it's a quadratic with integer coefficients. So we've convinced ourselves that for that kind of symmetric choice of fluxes, in this simple case, you get supersymmetric solutions when the resulting tau uh, satisfies a quadratic equation with integer coefficients. Or rather, you have to choose the fluxes so that tau will satisfy that resulting quadratic equation with integer coefficients. But we heard about that condition already in Gukov's talk. That's the, precisely the condition that the T2s admit something called complex multiplication by mathematicians. So in this case, at least, there's a sor sort of satisfying answer where you find solutions for these symmetric choices when the moduli uh, are at these specially symmetric tori. Now, unfortunately, there is no totally general connection between the two notions, so one can actually solve the equations in much greater generality than I did, but uh, the simple characterization mathematically of what the solutions look like does not persist. Okay, so that took care of fixing the complex structure moduli for us. There was still the issue of primitivity, and you can convince yourself, just based on the explicit forms of H and F that I told you, that primitivity is satisfied at some co-dimension in the Kähler moduli space for those fluxes. So the result is that in this class of models, with those simple choices, the dilaton gets fixed, the complex structure gets fixed, and the Kähler moduli are significantly constrained, though certainly not fixed. You see, you can see from this equation that if you find any solution for the Kähler class, you can always scale it up, because if j wedge g is 0, then any multiple of j wedge g is 0. So you'll never fix the overall volume in this class of constructions. 
And in this full class of models, you end up with n equals 1 or sometimes n, n equals 2 or 3 uh, preserved supersymmetry uh, with masses for the moduli at a scale that's alpha prime over r cubed that just comes from the supergravity Lagrangian. So for natural choices of r, uh, that, of course, is rather high scale. I should say that there's been a lot of related work. The most closely related to what I just described was by Fry and Polchinski, and there's older work and, and many other papers uh, on other aspects of this kind of thing. Now, as I said, the overall radius uh, is never fixed in these models. Okay. Uh, and that, of course, is still a problem. Okay. You could hope that either some kind of instanton effects in the case where you preserved supersymmetry, or even alpha prime corrections in cases where you didn't preserve supersymmetry, uh, might fix the radius. And there's been some interesting work in that direction. But of course, then the no-scale prediction of small cosmological constant goes away, and, and uh, you're in the soup. And I don't have anything helpful to say about that. That's why, uh, at this stage, I pre prefer to talk about the supersymmetric solutions. Um, I, I should also say in passing, though I don't have time to talk about it more, that these constructions have very interesting type 2a mirrors. They're, they're sort of uh, the mirror of a Calabi-Yau with h-flux is not a Calabi-Yau. It's some interesting uh, geometry that I haven't encountered before. Um, and they're also heterotic analogs of these models. OK, I want to move now to my second subject, that of trying to connect up, uh, in part of a larger configuration space, vacuous different amounts of Minkowski supersymmetry. So let me set the stage for why I'm interested in this question. Uh, the point is that we know from many examples, those of conifold transitions between n equals 2 vacuo of type 2 strings, or transitions which change the number of tensor multiplets in six-dimensional 0, 1 vacuo of string theory, or so-called chirality changing transitions in four-dimensional n equals 1 models with chiral fermions, that string theory likes its configuration spaces to be all connected up uh, in some more non-trivial and interesting way than saying, well, you can decompactify all the models and get back to 10 dimensions. Okay? In other words, it likes them to be connected up at finite distance in moduli space. So you could very naively ask, OK, well, what about connecting the vacuole with different amounts of supersymmetry? For instance, in four dimensions, n equals 4 is possible in Minkowski space, and so is n equals 2 or 1. And it's a fact that one cannot have as close a connection between these things, uh, as far as we know, uh, as the kind of connection I was just alluding to. So it was proved by Banks and Dixon, for instance, that transitions between these vacuoles with different amounts of supersymmetry are not possible in the perturbative heterotic string, remaining on a moduli space. And uh, in the type 2 picture, where one would want to go from k3 times t2 to a calabi yau geometry to change the supersymmetry, Aspinwall also argued that this is not possible. But on the other hand, the notion of connectedness I've been describing is a bit stronger than one really cares about for physics. Okay? For many purposes, people don't care if you can connect two different vacua at zero energy. The interesting question is the following. String theory has a natural scale, the string scale or the Planck scale. And the question you should ask is, can you connect vacua by traversing barriers that are very low compared to the string or Planck scale? So you know what you're talking about in effective field theory. So that could be relevant, for instance, if in early universe cosmology, you're at temperatures higher than the height of the barrier, but much lower than the string or Planck scale, so we know what we're talking about. So the question is, can you find hints or proof that the vacuum with different amounts of supersymmetry are connected in that sense? Well, if that is the case, see, it's quite hard to write down the exact potential on, on this configuration space. But if that is the case, there's a closely related fact, which is that you should be able to write down spherical domain walls whose tension characterizes the potential barrier between the different vacua. And so they should have a tension that's very small compared to the Planck scale. They should have a radius that's large compared to L Planck, if you're to describe them well. And in particular, you would also like for them to be well outside their Schwarzschild radius. That, that's a constraint, because otherwise you can't look in and see what's inside the bubble. Okay. And my point is that in this class of models, it's obvious that you can do this and connect models with different amounts of supersymmetry in the sense of showing that they admit these low-tension spherical domain walls. So for instance, you can take the n equals 4 vacuum, the t-dual of type 1 theory on t6, which has no fluxes. You can take some simple choice of flux. I've written one down here that preserves some other amount of supersymmetry. In this particular case, you would find vacuum with n equals 2 supersymmetry. And you can arrange so that so this fixes the moduli at some reasonably symmetric point where the taus are i and the delton is of order 1. So let's just put the n equals 4 vacuum at that choice of moduli 2, just for simplicity. Then the real question is, how, how on earth do we make this bubble in string theory? I mean, string theory has some constrained set of objects. Can we make these vacuum bubbles? And the answer is that string theory provides us with the right ingredients. 
So it's known, for instance, that in a Nevo-Schwartz 5 brain, if it wraps some cycle sigma 3 in T6, and some S2, some big sphere of radius rho in spacetime in R4, then as one traverses the bubble, the shell of radius rho, the H flux through the dual cycle to sigma 3 jumps by a single unit. And similarly, you could say the same words for a D5 brain and the Ramon Ramon F3 flux. So then it's an easy matter to just write down brain configurations that will engineer the right jump in fluxes to take you from the fluxes that correspond to the n equals 4 vacuum to fluxes for which the solution for moduli would have reduced supersymmetry. And we can estimate the tension quite easily if the torus has rough scale r or radius r. The tension of such a wrapped brain, we've set g string to be fixed already. So for both ns and d brains, a good estimate is that it will be r cubed over alpha prime cubed. And Planck in four dimensions, you can just compute from staring at the action. It goes like r cubed over alpha prime squared. So you can convince yourself that the things we need to be confident in the existence of this bubble as four-dimensional physicists, the fact that it's large compared to the Planck length and that it has low tension in Planck units, okay, will be satisfied as long as you make rho large but keep it less than r cubed over alpha prime to keep it uh, from becoming a black hole. Okay. So since r can be made quite large, in these models it's an exact modulus, as I said, okay, you can make rho, uh, you can arrange for bubbles of, of essentially arbitrary size by tuning this modulus. Okay. Now this bubble of NS and D5s, of course, will collapse because these objects have tension and they're on some sphere in spacetime. But the order, uh, you know, the order of magnitude of the amount of time it will take for them to collapse uh, is, again, something that you can make arbitrarily large. So the claim is that one can make arbitrarily large and long-lived bubbles with arbitra oops, arbitrarily low tension. Uh, by tuning R. So that, to me, gives strong evidence that at large R, R which is 100 times the string length, say, uh, one can find a picture where you have vacuum with these different amounts of supersymmetry, and they're connected by some potential barrier whose height is very low compared to the Planck scale. And the reason I'm saying that is, if the height were very high compared to the Planck scale, or of order of the Planck scale, one would not find bubbles that tunnel between them with such low tension. Now, you can obviously do the same thing I did for all flux vacuum on any fixed manifold. So in particular, all flux configurations on T6. Um, the bubble dynamic analysis I did here was extremely crude, but we wrote down some time-dependent solutions and estimated uh, various corrections to the picture uh, in the paper. So you can look at that. Um, I should mention here that stronger notions of what it means for vacuum to be connected have been described by other physicists, notably Banks, uh, who asks that two vacuum to be called connected should have the property that a physicist in one should be able to compute properties of the vacuum uh, elsewhere to arbitrarily high precision by doing better and better experiments. I'm not sure, and I think it's probably false, that these vacua uh, are connected in that way. So the kind of connection I'm talking about is weaker. OK, since I have a few minutes, it's still only on that other color, um, I, I will rush through a, a quick discussion of uh, the third subject I wanted to talk about, the so-called bouncing brain cosmology. So as you learned in Gettings' talk, there are worked type 2b solutions where you have a calabi manifold, which grows in some part of it uh, an ADS-like throat, whereas you move along one direction of the calabi uh, the R4 uh, metric is being significantly warped. Okay? So you have some compact calabi m with fluxes. Uh, the canonical example of this comes from embedding the klebanov strassler warped deformed conifold into a compact geometry, which is something we did with uh, Steve and Joe. And the question I'd like to ask is a simple one. Many of these models require transverse D3 brains for tadpole conditions. What happens, uh, what is the, the so-called mirage cosmology on one of these brains if you kick it around, and in particular if you're sitting here and you kick it down the throat? Okay, that's a reasonably natural question. Now, as a warm-up, one should remember that this, this story that eventually led to the klebanov strassler solution was quite convoluted. There's an easier metric that was first found by Klebanov and Zeitlin that had many of the right properties but wasn't quite as well defined. So let's approximate this throat by the klebanov zeitlin solution. Because in this region, after all, uh, the, the metric is well described by the klebanov strassler metric. Well, that approximation, here's the geometry. There are the Minkowski coordinates. There's the R direction going down the throat. And there's this Einstein manifold, T11. Okay. And H of R is this harmonic-like function. And the question we'd like to ask is, what time-dependent physics does a D3-brain observer kick down this throat with constant velocity C? 
Okay. It's a no-force background in a certain sense. And so if you make V small enough, the, the background is really quite well controlled, and it's a question you can answer by just looking at the Born-Infeld action. Okay. So the induced metric on the brain will look like this, where I've rescaled the time to be the brain observer proper time. And here R is, of course, a function of time along the brain trajectory. So you move down the throat, and you get some effective cosmology where H is a function of R of T. And of course, it's clear that this is a Friedman-Robertson-Walker cosmology. You can just rewrite it in this form with an A of T that's given by some power of that harmonic function. Quite clear. Now, I want to make several points at this stage because I don't have time to really do any of the born and felt analysis. Okay. The first is, as we learned from Randall and Sundram, as you move down one of these five-dimensional warped throats, the graviton wave function has an R-dependent overlap, the four-dimensional graviton wave function. Has, has an effective R-dependent overlap with the infalling brain. So if by M open, we denote some mass scale of a mode on this brain that a physicist on this brain is using to set their scale, say the proton mass, or in this case, maybe an open string mass would be more relevant, okay? then there's some relation that says as you move down the throat, G Newton times M open squared is varying. And in particular, in this geometry, it goes like A of T squared. You can choose to describe that in many different ways. Here's the one I would like, which I think is natural. I think it would be natural for a physicist on this brain to say that they should hold their particle masses fixed. Elementary particles have fixed masses. And then they say, uh-oh, G Newton is time varying. And in particular, okay, the size of the universe in Planck units that this fellow sees uh, would be fixed because G Newton varies with time. But nevertheless, let's stick with this guy. He has his fixed elementary particle masses. And in units of his fixed inverse length scale then, the proper distance between galaxies is in fact shrinking as you move down the throat or it would be expanding as you move up the throat. Okay? And you do see blue shifting or red shifting of photons appropriately. Okay? So in that sense, this guy really sees a cosmology. The second point I would like to make is that the klebanov zeitlin metric has a naked singularity at the end in the infrared. Okay? So in our warm-up model that I described, the resulting cosmology on this brain would have a space-like singularity when the brain smacks into the end of the throat. And that would happen in finite time. Okay. But then we get to the obvious punchline. We know that Klebanov and Strauss were famous because their resolved solution resolves the naked singularity of the klebanov zeitlin geometry. So in the real complicated throat geometry that we've embedded in this compact collabial, what will happen is that the brain moves down this now smooth throat. The warp factor is decreasing. It reaches the end. But lo and behold, we have 10 dimensions in string theory, not five, and it smoothly goes around the end and goes back out. Okay? But that means that since the warp factor is now increasing, the brain cosmology has bounced in the way that this observer describes physics. So you can just, in the small v limit, integrate the born infeld trajectory and see that you get a nice smooth bounce. Okay? And so, at least in the sense that Klebanov's light one is resolved by Klebanov's Strassler, this is a sort of mirage cosmology instance of string theory resolving a space-like singularity. Thank you. Uh, I'll just put up my conclusions. I'm done. Thank you, Shamit. Um, there's a question over there. Uh, Massimo Porratti, NYU. Um, which singularity theorem, uh, which assumption of singularity theorems do you evade? Because that seems to be in contradiction with some. So, of so, so clearly, models. okay. Um, in, in this frame in which the brain observer sees this nice FRW cosmology, I said G Newton is time varying. Okay, you're not actually also in Einstein frame. And if you look at the energy momentum tensor to which this metric, the, the one that this brain guy is using couples to, it violates uh, many of the energy conditions. And in particular, to get a k equals zero FRW universe to bounce, he has to think that the, the null energy condition is violated. And in fact, he does. So in that frame, certainly he thinks the null energy condition is violated. Is this the only microphone? Should be two. So if you work in the, if you do work in the eye. The follow-up on Massimo's question, if you do work in the Einstein frame, where the singularity theorem should be valid, 
does anything funny happen? Or does it just look like a cosmology that never had a singularity to start with? Uh, I believe, OK, so, so I, we can't control the solution eternally because we started at some initial time with the velocity, and we eventually leave the region where the throat is a valid approximation and get to the kalabi Yau, where there are other complicated objects like orientifold planes. But the spirit of the question is, um, is answered by the following statement. Um, basically, in Einstein frame, all it looks like is there's a time-varying scalar field, and there's some masses of particles that depend on this time-varying scalar field. And in the time it takes for us um, in these approximations to see the bounce in the other frame, you don't encounter any singularities in Einstein frame. Okay. Now, at much later times, I don't have any trick for evading the singularity theorems in Einstein frame. So I think it's true that after the bounce has been finished by this, this poor brain observer, you know, the, the full universe will eventually do something horrible because I don't know how to evade, uh, I don't know how to violate the null energy condition there. I'm Fernando Cabello from them. Uh, on the first part of your talk, how generic do you find that uh, you cannot fix the full model? Is that a generic fixture or just a particular c case of your model? The, the fact that you can't fix all moduli um, in this class of models is just true uh, for the reasons I said of the no scale structure. Now, there are other constructions. I mean, I know. Um, for instance, Eva Silverstein has made constructions that break supersymmetry at the string scale. Uh, and then you can fix all the moduli. Uh, the drawback of that is only that you then always end up with a, a space which, well, with large enough cosmological constant that you already know you're wrong. Okay. And, and, and so in that sense, um, we don't yet know of a way to fix all moduli and yet preserve supersymmetry down to a, a very low scale. Okay. So that, that I, I think is fair to say. Thank you.